So this is Colleen again. Thank you for your patience. According to the screen that I'm seeing, uh, we do still have several people logged into the webinar, so we will continue. I also want to mention that the webinar slides, um, they've really been designed so that people can pretty much walk through them on their own, and we will post those on our website tomorrow, um, as well as send an email to everybody who is on the call to know that they can, uh, that they can access them there. So for those of you that are still on, thank you very much. Um, we are now on to the draft project implementation plan section of today's webinar and starting uh, with the requirements, steps, and target dates uh, will be the first part that we review. Just a little bit of context. So our implementation plan overview slide is, a, is the one you're seeing now. The requirements for the project, um, for those of you that have been involved from the beginning, you're well aware that the project requirements have been preset by the Department of Health. In fact, for certain projects, there are actually preset target dates um, for some requirements as well. Overall, uh, what you're seeing today is a draft. The implementation plan for all projects, as well as a variety of infrastructure work streams, that full um, implementation plan is due to DOH on July 31st. And it'll drive all of our subsequent reporting. So it's important to hit the right level of detail in the implementation plan. We need to show enough detail so that the department understands that we recognize the major steps that we need to take, um, how those steps um, interrelate and might be sequenced over time or are dependent on one another um, in order to be completed. So the timeline is, is important, and I'll make a few comments on timeline as we look at those uh, requirements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, detailed work plans and budgets are not being sought by the DOH or by AHI at this time. Um, when you look at today's implementation plan, I know it'll strike uh, some of you as, as, a, as it being a, a, a very high level plan, and uh, that is the case. Um, what we're submitting to DOH now is a set of steps that are high level and generic enough that they're applicable to all of the partner organizations across the full geography of the PPS. Um, your team, your organization will certainly need to create a more detailed work plan so that you can generate a budget. Um, of you know, what your cost as an organization will be to take part, and certainly you'll need that more detailed work plan so that internally your own management team is able to oversee uh, progress um, on, that, uh, on that project. Some of the questions to consider as you listen to today's webinar, um, we really value your feedback. In fact, I want to mention now that I'm, uh, I regret that we're not meeting face-to-face -to, -face to work on this implementation plan as a group, uh, ideally through a series of meetings. But at this point in time, the palliative care uh, project is, is a team that um, does not have a, a project manager. And we at least wanted to be able to put some information in front of you in today's webinar and solicit feedback um, if, if you're able to provide it. So think about the steps that you're seeing. Um, are they comprehensive enough? Are there some steps you might add? Uh, does this, is this step clearly stated to you? If not, how would you re reword that step? It does the, is the flow across um, target dates uh, reasonable? And of course, any general feedback that you might have. What you see here is the speed commitment that has been made. Um, again, those of you who've been involved from the beginning will remember that, that term, speed and scale. Um, speed commitments are the date and time by which all participating sites will meet all project requirements. So we've committed to meeting all the requirements for this project by DISRIP year three, quarter two. So that would be following across on your grid. Um, DISRIP year three, the second quarter, is uh, ends um, September of 2017, would be DISRIP year three, Q2. So now we'll start taking a look at some of the requirements. Um, this is not a fully developed implementation plan. We are looking for some input and feedback from you. There's um, quite a bit of detail that will need to be added in. Um, for some of you, I hope this kind of serves as a refresher of what those requirements are. The first requirement is to integrate palliative care into appropriate primary care practices that have or will have achieved MCQH PCMH certification. So importantly, the palliative care project is about integrating palliative into patient-centered medical homes. 
In order to do that, we'll need to identify the PCMH providers who are part of the model. That, in fact, um, has essentially that set has essentially been done. Um, we're, we're fairly clear on the, the, which practices are the ones that want to be part of this palliative care project and integrate the palliative um, uh, uh, care pathways and protocols uh, into their practice. We'll need to obtain MOUs from those PCPs uh, showing their agreement to be part of the project and that they recognize that in order to participate in this project, it's required that the practice achieve PCMH, MCQA uh, recognition at the 2014 standards level three by the third year of the uh, implementation. So we, the target date you're seeing is the date to obtain the MOUs. Uh, an additional step which would have the same target date is to ensure that all the primary care practices that are involved in the palliative care project are part of the 2A2 project implementation plan. Project 2A2 is the project that provides support to practices for achieving their MCQA certification um, by making sure that they're all involved in that, in that project. All of the steps towards certification don't need to be listed here. They're handled in the 2A2, um, in the 2A2 project. You see a step on your screen, and I think I've inadvertently deleted the requirement that goes along with that step. Um, the requirement there is to integrate um, community-based resources, including hospice, into the, uh, into the project plan. So the step that you're seeing is that we'll be working with community-based um, organizations, including hospice and others, in order um, in order to leverage some of their, uh, their expertise and capabilities in developing the palliative practice model that is incorporated uh, into the TCP practice. There it is with the steps. You can skip that one. We can go to the next one. Okay. The third requirement is to develop and adopt clinical guidelines that have been agreed to um, by all partners including what are the services provided and the eligibility for those services. Um, by the end of this year, as I mentioned in the governance, um, we'll need to establish um, the clinical, uh, the quality committees. I, so the committee structure won't be in place till the end of this year. It would be an activity that would take place in the, in the first half of 2016, would be developing and adopting those, um, those clinical guidelines as well as um, providing training. So the next uh, step that you see here is engaging staff in the training. Uh, some of the steps uh, for training would be developing that palliative care training plan. That step would happen in conjunction with the workforce committee. Again, that's slated for early uh, 2016 or first half of 2016. By the end of 2016, we would have wanted to have completed the provision of that training on the palliative care skills and competencies as well as uh, palliative care as well as on the actual protocols that have been um, adopted. When, when it comes to this requirement and, and the steps, um, there will be an opportunity here for, uh, for providers to uh, attend uh, professional development, training, certifications uh, in palliative. Uh, we'll be able to support that during the calendar year of 2016. The next requirement you see is actually a requirement that's common to many projects. Um, DOH has listed out as a requirement that we be engaging with Medicaid managed care um, on, on coverage of these types of services. Um, they're actually looking to us to establish agreements with NCOs that address the coverage of palliative care supports and services. That we have, um, that we have slated as one of the last, is one of the last uh, requirements to be met, you know, given the, given the nature of that requirement that it requires engagement with payers and it requires this PPS network as a whole um, to be engaging with those payers uh, in negotiating agreements, we expect that that'll be a late, one of the later requirements um, that we met, that we meet. 
And finally, the last requirement is another requirement that is common across projects, that is to use EHRs or other IT platforms to track patients that are engaged in the project. Uh, this uh, target date ties to the commitment that we made to report on numbers of actively engaged patients. Uh, again, for those of you that were involved um, early on in DISRIP, last, last uh, early winter, we looked at the definition of actively engaged for each project and we submitted some numbers and dates um, by which we would engage patients. The first date that we are required to be reporting on this is how many patients have been actively engaged. Our first date that we'll have to submit a number and be able to track and produce that across the network is September 30th of 2016. Um, should we not meet that, it would that uh, date that would have an impact on our funding. Okay, moving on to risks and mitigation. Uh, for all the projects, uh, we're required to identify risks and discuss how we intend to mitigate those risks. We have four risks that have been identified for this project. One is the lack of qualified or credentialed professionals with palliative care experience. Our mitigation strategy there is to utilize the workforce committee on, uh, on training and recruitment needs. An additional risk is that historically palliative care services have been, um, have not been, they, have not, they either haven't been widely available or where available, they haven't been well, well utilized in terms of um, being identified, the appropriate target population being identified and uh, early on to access palliative support um, at the right point in time. So uh, the mitigation strategy here is, is really to one that is directed at both um, patients, providers, and the community in general to do some education on what palliative care is, what it isn't, dispel the myths, and uh, in addition to those clinical protocols and pathways, um, trying to uh, make both patients and providers more knowledgeable and receptive to accessing these services. Uh, two more risks and their associated mitigations are shown here. Um, one risk is the current, um, it's the way it's stated here is cost effectiveness of palliative care. So, you know, the, the, the risk um, could be stated as the inadequate reimbursement for palliative care. The mitigation strategy here is to work with uh, evaluators um, to develop a model to demonstrate outcomes and be able to have some data so that we're better positioned to um, negotiate for, uh, for different levels and types of reimbursement for palliative. A final risk is that uh, some you know, smaller practices uh, certainly don't have, um, don't have the resources to hire dedicated staff to support uh, palliative care uh, within their patient-centered medical home practice. We will have to work to mitigate that by exploring um, options for having centralized um, palliative care supports that can then be deployed across multiple uh, small uh, practices. As I mentioned earlier, questions, uh, questions and feedback will both be elicited and we'd like to see those come through the DISRIP uh, mailbox, and here's your, here are the directions for how to access that mailbox. Um, questions, feedback, you can simply send an email to that DISRIP mailbox that you see here. If you have specific um, feedback um, on the implementation plan, certainly if you have sections of, that you'd like to make substantial contributions to, we'd be, be happy to have that. And anything that we receive within the week, within a week, Anything we receive in a week, uh, I can certainly make sure is incorporated into the July 31st submission. Please use the subject line IP feedback and be sure to specify which project you are referring to. The, the actual draft of the, the actual draft of the implementation plan, instead of these slides, it'll, it'll be the slides will be available, but you'll also have available the draft as a Word document. That will be, it says here Excel, it's actually Word, but you'll, you'll have that posted on the AHI website as well. So should you be in a position to, to want to um, provide 
um, ample feedback on implementation planning. Um, you could down, you'd be able to download it in Word and um, type right into that and send it back as an attachment. Uh, if you have more brief um, comments or questions, um, again, just you know, an email itself uh, will suffice. So I apologize for the technical difficulties we had early on. I do appreciate that several of you um, did stay on the webinar, and we will post this one to the uh, AHI website. Um, in closing, uh, I know there are many people out there who are who this project is near and dear to them. Uh, despite the fact that we don't currently have a project manager on it, and we haven't been uh, we haven't convened meetings. That is certainly not an indication of lack of priority or interest on, on our side here at AHI. Uh, we're working hard on recruitment, and uh, we do expect to be convening a team uh, in the near future. So thanks for your time today, and I'll look forward to seeing your emails.